At this point, I may have become so desensitized to Hollywood identity, politics, and entertainment culture wars that I wish I could just disconnect and enjoy myself, somehow oblivious to the carnage around me, like a dancer at a nightclub during a John Wick film. But one does not earn 20,000 subscribers without making sacrifices, so strap on your snorkel, take a deep breath, and jump with me into the choppy waters of The Little Mermaid 2023, a film with the photorealistic look and vacuous self-regard of a Derek Zoolander commercial. Wetness is the essence of beauty. The Little Mermaid lives in an underwater kingdom with her widowed father, the Sea King Triton, and her older sisters. Plucky and curious young Ariel watches a celebration being held on a ship in honor of a handsome prince and falls in love with him. When a violent storm hits, sinking the ship, the little mermaid saves the prince from drowning. She delivers him unconscious to the shore. Ariel, longing for the prince, visits her ostracized Aunt Ursula, who presents a deal. She will transform Ariel into a human for three days, during which Ariel must receive a true love's kiss from Eric to remain human permanently. If she fails, she will transform back into a mermaid, and Ursula will claim her. To become human, Ariel must give up her tail, the ability to breathe underwater, and her siren voice, the last of which Ursula will keep in a nautilus shell. Ariel accepts the deal, and is given human legs. We are introduced to a perturbingly plump, chubby, flabby-assed Prince Eric. Jonah Hauer King is generically drippy, sexless, and benign. The visual aesthetic underwater is an odd and murky mix of a National Geographic sea documentary, crossed with the 1999 visual graphics of the underwater Gungan city in Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Triton's daughters are dressed like they are in a trashy Midwest high school mermaid-themed prom, and who move in a stilted, undulating way that looks about as graceful as an eight-year-old girl tottering about in her mother's high heels. Esteemed actor Javier Bardem, will you make shrewd future decisions about which roles to play? Bardem plays Triton, who looks like Aquaman's gay uncle, and we are also introduced to Sebastian the Crab, who has been rendered to look like an unappealingly typical crab, and Flounder, who looks like a common fish. Melissa McCarthy's version of Ursula, the estranged sister of King Triton, is actually an enjoyable element of this film. In fact, Ursula's motivations are understandable, and her brother, King Triton, is a little bit of a jerk. Her character beats are pleasingly vampy and sly, McCarthy appealingly chews the scenery, and other times lurks and prowls and sprawls. She is suitably lascivious. There are many terrible musical genres, ranging from Tongan Fangu Fangu nose flute, to the experimental atonal quarter tone classical music of Alois Haber. But the true excruciating arse end of music will always be the musical number, full of cloying sentiment, melodramatic suspensions, and worst of all, the fake, just occurring thought or unfolding reflection. Eric's adoptive parents are black, of abstracted Caribbean-ish stock, and the film takes place in a highly civilized kingdom that is at least the degree of advancement, refinement, and wealth of the distant, barely mentioned Europe. Eric is played by a grown man, yet is treated like a 15-year-old, which is jarring. When Ariel makes it to land, with the help of Ursula's potion, there is the obvious clunky metaphor in which she caterwauls and wails about the discomfort but necessity of wearing stifling, inhibiting clothes and corsets, and the adoption of social roles and expectations in early womanhood. Halle Bailey, for all the hoopla and commotion, is fine, and in the end, the identity politics fades pretty quickly largely because the film has been transposed from a European fable to a Caribbean kind of vibe. And while this is annoying, and reflects the same old problem of Hollywood race-swapping leads to classic properties and calling it empowering instead of going to the effort of creating new worlds with which to express diversity, the real problem with the film is just its overall flatness, redundancy, and generic emptiness. The thing is, the movie drags. It is woefully ponderous. Sebastian is a pain in the ass who ought to be used sparingly for comedic bits, but has whole scenes with sparsely separated dialogue and antics. Prince Eric has no personality or presence. He and Ariel's romantic day trip is tedious. The aesthetic of the film is gloomy and somehow stark at the same time, with an extraordinary amount of black and purple filling the frame, interspersed with glaring interiors above water that make you squint to readjust. Aquafina as Scuttle the Seagull is horrendous. 
Even as an exaggerated, affected cartoon character, the sound of her voice is appalling, atonal, and you just want it to stop. I was flying over land and sea and ear to the ground. Then I came flying here for you to see and hear what I found. Remember that swamp? Remember my song in the swamp? And I was like, wah, pick up, wah, wah. There's a whole bunch of curse shenanigans. Melissa McCarthy swells up to the size of a giant and temporarily rules the oceans. Then everything resolves, and it ends with a scene of reconciliation and farewell for Ariel. A scene that is modern Hollywood's greatest socio-cultural fantasy. Super camp, brightly coloured, androgynous people of all races, genders and backgrounds, smiling and happy. California's most indulgent idealization of itself. A bliss of diverse, loving, unified, technicolor harmony. Like Avatar, The Way of Water, where everyone's splashing about in the shadow of the Golden Gate Bridge. This will probably sell a ton of merch, and expect to see Ariel's look of guileless, searching wonder, face upraised, on the lids of children's lunchboxes and backs of school bags. And in the commodified McDonald'sization of Disney, this is a perfectly adequate equivalent of the filet of fish but other than that, it's destined to join the equally murky Peter Pan and Wendy, and Drab Willow, as a forgettable new iteration of a classic property. And then we can all move on to whatever else Disney wants to drag back out of the vault. 